sure. Cynthia was coming. I thought Sarah was coming. Yeah. We had six last night at, at our meeting. I think everybody oh, wow. was Yeah. I think everybody David, was I think. You got on the air. So. Oh, yeah. David back. <laughs> Do you think it's this? Yeah. Uh, so that's the one you want me to use? Everyone uh, yeah. They have like a levy built on all along the uh, <coughs> Oh, would that be it? When you're driving, you can actually see the ocean. It's the levy's high enough. Mm. But you get out of your car. car. Well, I'm going to stand up. It's off right now, so just look. I think as long as you stay out of the areas where the feedback is. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Okay, I guess we're all set to get started. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the school board town council workshop meeting. And if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully this will be an interesting evening and we'll all get to learn a little bit more about school consolidation. I'd like to turn it over to our superintendent, Alan Hawkins. Thank you very much. I only have a few words to say and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bruce Smith who is going to help us go through some of the specific information. Just as a reminder to all of you that uh, uh, in mid-January, you heard from the governor, who at that point in time had made a proposal which would uh, reduce the number of school districts in the state to 26. Uh, there were combinations that were made that included districts that were going to be anywhere from 2,500 students to 20,000 plus, which was a group that we belonged to at that point in time. During the next few months, there have been many discussions, many plans, many plans tried out, et cetera, in the process of trying to see where we will go. And finally, a very short time ago, the uh, PL Chapter 240 was passed. And that PL uh, 240 chapter is the one that really discusses what the school systems and the school districts should look like. Uh, as part of that process, it talked about the fact that we needed to uh, meet together in a town situation, town council, school board, and citizens to talk about the possibilities, to talk about what are the positives and what are the negatives of each, and to help begin to make decisions. By August 31st, I must send to the Commissioner of Education a decision from Cape Elizabeth as far as the possibility of what route they'll go with. I understood from the commission the other day, which could be changed again, that we could make more than one proposal. So we will talk about those proposals tonight and some of the pieces of that process. Before we go too, too much further, though, I would like to take just a moment to thank Cynthia Dill, our representative, who did an enormous amount of work in Augusta uh, as this whole process was, was moving forward and uh, worked closely with uh, the legislative people in Augusta to get to a point where we are today. For those of you who use our website, if you go to our website, you'll see a very important report that came out uh, in May, which talks about those schools, those districts which have high performing schools and yet maintain a budget process which allows them to meet the needs of the school system uh, at, a, at a specific rate. And so Cape Elizabeth became one of six systems in the state that fit into that category. 
Uh, I've even heard that the work that was done in Augusta was truly focused at a place like Cape Elizabeth, which sets not only between three large cities that are over 2,500 students, uh, and the ocean, which does not offer us students to go with, and other systems which are further away from us. So with that in mind, what I am going to do, uh, we talked about this meeting tonight, and we know that the information changes con constantly. But there are certain people who have, have spent an enormous amount of time gathering that information. One of them is Bruce Smith from the law firm of Drummond Woodson, who we work with very closely. So after much uh, discussion, we decided that the best route to go was to ask Bruce to come now, because certainly if he isn't here tonight, I'll probably be turning to him with the questions that will be asked tonight that we don't have the answers to. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Bruce, and Bruce will do the overview of the different possibilities, we will answer questions, and we'll head up a question and answer period afterwards. Uh, I will also be here with information as I can feed it. I have information from our business manager, and we'll work our way through this process. We're looking at a 7.30 to 9 uh, period of time. Uh, if questions are still quite interesting, I was going to say heated, I shouldn't say that, uh, quite interesting still, we may go a little bit longer. But we also will need to determine a, a next step in the process before I turn a final proposal into the commissioner before August 31st. So without further ado, Bruce, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Um, I will stand up. Maybe I should use this if it works. <laughs> okay, back there in the booth. It's not working. She's saying no. I mean, I can hear you. It's just not the microphone. All right. I'll just speak from here. Is that going to work okay? Stand under that one, sort of, and pull it out a little bit. Stand under that one. Well, you can, it, under the boom. Telescope's out if you want. Well. I'll let, the, I'll let the AV crew handle that, but um, good evening. As Alan said, uh, we've, at my firm, the School Law Practice Group, we've been following this process very closely. Uh, my uh, partner, Dick Spencer, was very active, was in Augusta almost the entire time this was being considered. And the consolidation law has traveled a long way from the governor's proposal where it started, as Alan said, at a proposal for only 26 school units in the state and that the, the, the configuration of these units would be mandated by the state. There would be no local choice as to uh, the configuration of the units or as to whether people could consolidate. Now, a lot has changed since then, and I'm not going to take you through that whole history. I'm going to talk about the end product. Uh, I should say that the end product is imperfect, and um, that's not necessarily to blame anybody, but it was an awful lot of work to accomplish in a very short period of time by the legislature. They didn't think of everything, clearly. There are some gaps in the law, clearly. There are some inconsistencies in the law. There are some difficult questions that I don't know the answers to. We do know that it's the intention of uh, the Commissioner of Education and the legislature to go back in January and look at problems with the law and try to fix them. So we know that's coming, but at the same time, you're already on a very tight, tight timetable in terms of getting going on what the law requires. So it's appropriate to be talking about this right now and to be dealing with it right now. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about a little bit of the basics of the law, then I'm going to turn to this PowerPoint. I tried to avoid doing a PowerPoint because PowerPoint's getting sort of negatively associated with this law in many places right now, but I only have nine slides, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, what is the purpose of this law? Um, the, the, the statute starts with a statement of basic, eight basic goals or purposes that the law is trying to achieve. And I'm going to just take a minute and go over those, because that's the backdrop against which you, know, you should be interpreting the law and applying the law and making your decisions about what to do as you go forward. First of all, um, goal number one is edu equitable educational opportunity for all students to demonstrate achievement of the content standards of the state system of learning results. Second, rigorous academic programs that meet the requirements of the system of learning results. Third, 
uniformity in the delivery of academic programs that meet the requirements of the system of learning results. Does that mean uniformity statewide? Or does that mean uniformity within school districts? It's not entirely clear to me. I might tend to think it means uniformity straight statewide. Greater uniformity, fourth, greater uniformity of tax rates for the support of schools. Fifth, efficient use of limited resources in order to achieve long-term sustainability and predictability in the support of public schools. Sixth, effective use of the public funds expended for the support of public schools by means of first, creation of cost-efficient organizational structures, and second, administrative structures and efficiencies that permit the organized, this is a long sentence, the organized and regular delivery of uniform state-sponsored professional development programs. Sort of buried in there, but this is something, a, a new facet we don't have an education law now, they say they want to introduce state-sponsored professional development. As you know, certainly the school board knows, teacher professional development is, is generally done strictly at the local level now. Where, how they're going to do this, how much money they're going to spend on it, who's going to pay for it, it's not clear, but that's the goal. Seventh, preservation of opportunities for school choice. Right now, I don't believe that's relevant to Cape Elizabeth because I don't think you have any school choice per se. This is for towns like uh, Raymond, for example, which has only a K-8 uh, district, and their high school students can choose what high school they attend. And eighth, the maximi maximization of opportunities to deliver services that can more effectively be provided in larger districts than from within smaller units or individual schools. That's the only reference in the law, but it is there that there's a preference for larger units over smaller units is based on the premise that it'll be more efficient to operate as a larger unit than a smaller unit. Is that premise valid? There's a lot of debate about that. Um, and I don't think it's a settled question by any means. Any regional school unit resulting from this law has to provide K-12 education. Again, not really an issue in Cape since you now provide K-12, but there are a lot of units around the state that only have a K through 8 and don't have a high school. The, uh, those are the basic goals and purposes of the law. The, uh, the general goal in terms of how many units we'll end up with is 80. Now, is that a hard and fast number? No, not really. It's intended that we achieve 80 school units or into a number of units that meets the administrative efficiencies established by statute. That seems to leave room for more, or perhaps less. I think it's highly unlikely it's going to be fewer than 80, but uh, there is room for, for more than 80. The other very basic standard in the law, the, the goal is to have administrative units with 2,500 or more students. That's the basic standard. Now, there are exceptions, and we'll get into those in a second. How many does CAPE have now? Right now, uh, as of this year, we had 1,803. We're looking at 1,756 for the fall, based on our kindergarten population and also graduation statistics. Watch your passes around. Mm -hmm. I'm going now to turn to this PowerPoint. Bunch of for the audience, if you'd like to look at them. And what I tried to do is this law is 61 pages long. If you've tried to read it, you know that it's very hard to follow. It doesn't read like a, uh, an exciting crime novel by any means. It's, it jumps around, it, it appears to be redundant in places, so it's a little hard to follow. What I tried to do here was, was boil down a basic flowchart of the most important decisions that you'll have to consider as a school unit complying with this law. So we start with, we start with the, uh, the uh, where we are now, which is that existing school units are reviewing options for consolidation, partnering with nearby units, considering their options now. That you're doing now has to be done by August 31st, as, as Alan said. Um, there is 
and an expectation that we're hearing from the Department of Education that during this process in the summer before August 31st, everybody will be exploring possible partnerships with other units. Now, that's not explicitly stated in the law, but that's certainly what the Commissioner and the Department of Ed are telling people. They're encouraging exploration of partnerships. They, their policy and their understanding of the law is that it does favor larger school units and that they want everyone in good faith to explore um, consolidating to form larger units. The first hard deadline for Cape Elizabeth School Board is August 31. That's when the school board has to submit a notice of intent to the Department of Education. What does that notice of intent have to say? The, uh, basically, this is where the two paths diverge. This is the fork in the road. And it, it may be possible for you to actually take both paths in the road. Commissioner, as Alan has said, uh, has suggested that it's possible to submit more than one potential approach. But I think in most cases, school boards are going to be picking one or the other. Um, the, the, the most common path is going to be the one looking at the screen from my angle on the left which is the notice of intent to form a regional school unit. RSU is a regional school unit. To form a regional school unit with one or more other units. Now, the notice of intent, what does that have to be? Does that have to be a whole detailed plan about all the details, uh, cost sharing, uh, how the schools are going to be structured, how the governance is going to be structured? No. The notice of intent is probably going to be a one-page or half-page document that says it is our intent to either um, submit a, a plan for consolidation, which is facing the screen the left side path, or to submit an alternative plan. The way the law is structured is the default is you have to submit a consolidation plan, but there are exceptions. And um, let's take a look at what those exceptions are. School units that may submit an alternative plan. Offshore, offshore islands, for whatever reason, from the very start, islands have, have been excluded from this entire process. And they continue to exist no matter how small. Botanicus has, I think, four or five students. They're their own school unit. But they're certainly very remote. They have a hard time commuting to uh, the mainland of the school. Um, the commissioner, by the way, there, there's some many offshore islands in there, 2013, that have school units now. The commissioner has said that they're going to count all the offshore offshore islands as one for purposes of the age. Not that each island is one unit, but all of them together are going to be counted as one unit, so that they won't eat away too many of the other 80. Also, a school operated by the Tribal School Committee, there are a few of those uh, up north and east. Um, a school administrative unit that serves more than 2,500 students. So units that serve 2,500 or more now can take the alternative plan route. And we're in a high density area, so we know that a lot of them right around here, this, they include Scarborough, South Portland, Portland, Westbrook, uh, Gorham, I believe, Wyndham. Um, there are quite a few right around here. Um, then there's another exception for a school unit that has over 1,200 but under 2,500. And that's where circumstances justify an exception to the requirement of 2,500 students. The, yes? I, I just want to um, just make it perfectly clear because there's been some questions. Um, this exception about efficient, high-performing district is an exception that was drafted by me and submitted as an amendment to the budget um, to specifically address Cape Elizabeth. So, to the extent there's been called into question whether or not Cape Elizabeth is an efficient, high-performing district, 
we are because I submitted the amendment and used a definition that was um, that Cape Elizabeth met and I discussed it with the Commissioner of Education. So I didn't know if you were aware of that legislative history but um, I just want to make it perfectly clear that that exception is is a result of Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> so, sorry. I just yeah, no thanks. I, yeah. I was aware that, that uh, I think that people are trying to look at it as, as not the Cape Elizabeth exception though, but as, a, as, a, as an exception based on uh, neutral principles about efficiency and high performance. Well, yeah, I had to get two-thirds of the legislature to vote for it, yes. so it couldn't just be about Cape Elizabeth, but it certainly had Cape Elizabeth um, as at least at the forefront of my mind when I drafted the um, amendment. So yes, it, I agree that there's five other mm -hmm. units, but I just wanted to be and to the extent that people might have been nervous as to whether or not Cape Elizabeth fit into that exception, um, in my view anyway, we do. Um, the, uh, just to finish up with the, the, the prior one though, the 1,200 to 2,500 on the surface um, it would fit within at least that number, but there are a number of factors that apply to that exception that really I think tell us that it's designed for rural school units you go up to certain places where there's very low population density in the north, in Rooster County, Washington County, or a lot of places actually, where it would be so hard to combine um, enough school units to achieve the 2,500 student level that you'd have this geographically huge unit. So I doubt that that exception has a lot of promise for Cape Elizabeth, but as uh, like you said, the next one, I think, is, is one that you're obviously considering um, an efficient, high-performing district, and we'll talk about what the criteria are for that in a second. Um, there is uh, yet another exception, this last one, uh, which people are calling the donut hole exception. This is for the, you know, the wallflower who never got a dance or the person who could never get matched up with anybody despite trying their best. Um, if you make an attempt to consolidate, use due diligence, and uh, you can't get a partner, therefore can't achieve that level, you may be granted an exception. It actually is conceivable that the kid could fit into that one, but again, it's not the one that, that fits you most neatly. But I think that as you explore this, you have to explore all aspects of the law. Um, so that's why I'm giving you at least a basic overview. Uh, what's an efficient, high-performing district? Um, there are two very, I think, very objective criteria. Um, a, it has to have at least three schools identified as higher performing in the May 2007 Maine Education Policy Research Institute report which is called the identification of higher and lower performing main schools. As Alan said, there's a link to that report on your website. So if you want to look at that, that's available to you there. Basically, that was a report written by uh, David Silvernail, a professor at the university, who applied his own analysis to, uh, to try to identify the characteristics of higher and lower performing schools. And he came up with a list. And um, so all we had to do was look at the list, and we find Pine Cove School, Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and the high school are all on that list. So you have three high performing schools based on that report. The other criterion is that you spend less than 4% of your total per pupil expenditures on system administration. My understanding is that, that it's under that. What's the figure now? 3.1%. Um, now, that will be subject to verification by the department because they want to make sure that, that the accounting system you're using um, matches theirs for purposes of determining what is system administration and what is not. Um, that isn't to imply that, that anyone would do anything inappropriate in that regard, it's just to ensure that, that, that all units that fit into this category do in fact spend less than 4% on system administration. 
The other thing that the uh, law says is that the commissioner must write rules by December 1, 2007, defining the criteria for high-performing, efficient school districts. Um, I'm not sure why that's in there because I think the criteria, and uh, since you may know the answer to that, because I think the criteria as they're written in the statute are, are very clear. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I know why it's in there. Um, it's in there because when the initial amendment that I drafted defined a high-performing, efficient school district as containing three uh, schools in that report, as well as the per pupil system administration, some legislators felt that that was um, going forward, like if, if you met the definition this year, that you should have to have your feet held to the fire going forward, and that that definition would become stale over time because of the May 2007 report that we were referring to. So the idea was that the um, identification of three schools in the May 2007 report um, was good for purposes of the initial legislation and identifying the high-performing efficient school districts right now. But going forward, the Department of, uh, of Education will work with the Education Committee at the Legislature to have a definition that's not so reliant on a dated report. And so that's where I think, so uh, we, we are going to meet, the, in my view, we're going to meet the exception this year. And going forward, it's my hope that we can participate in the um, Education um, Committee experience to, you know, have a definition that is, is workable going forward. So it's my intent as a legislator to monitor the Education Committee and alert the Capos of the School Board that when the um, substantive rules are coming up for public hearing that we are involved and, and, and that sort of thing. So that's the reason. So it made some legislators feel more comfortable in supporting the amendment if they knew that these districts who were high performing and efficient this year and therefore exempt would also have to be high performing and efficient going forward to maintain their exemption. Well, that makes sense. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask questions now or we get that. Shoot. Um, I'm interested in hearing what since my name is David Nelson, the board of the judges, it was here. Um, I'm glad to hear that from Cynthia as to why that appears. Because quite frankly, I think that a more negative view of that. Uh, I look at it as a, a, a gaping hole for uh, um, public education that clearly favors the consolidation in almost all respects to rewrite the rules, assuming the Constitution can rewrite the rules to override a state enacted statute, which I'm not sure you can, but it basically says that they can, uh, there's a fairly significant difference in uh, the section which talks about how they can rewrite it and what the actual statutory language is. The section was talked about how they can be right. It says that they will be guided by the criteria used in this uh, report, which you ought to read the report if you want to find a convoluted analysis of what a high performance school is. I've read it, and as he's quoted, it's a silver, you know, it's quoted, it was designed that only a handful of schools would qualify. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be politically unpalatable to people over time. They want, high, they want a chance to become a high performance school, and they don't want the criteria to be broad, hopefully they will want broad, to be more than five or six schools that are 280 some of school districts. But the exception, the, the uh, tag on at the very end of the bill, which allows the DOE to suggest by rulemaking, excuse me, must establish by rulemaking, and then oddly says that it will submit them to the Joint Committee on Education. It doesn't say that the Joint Committee must accept them. It doesn't say that it must be voted on by the legislature, although I think constitutionally you have a good argument that it has to be done. And the difference is they say that uh, guided by the criteria, maybe they'll tighten them, maybe they'll lose them. Who knows what they'll do I, I, I clearly look at DOE as not favoring this exemption. They've come on record so far, and a couple of parents I've been told about. It's not driven. Secondly, they say an establishment is an efficiency factor on a pure pupil expenditure. This says on a on total per pupil expenditure. It's a percentage of the total expenditure for the school budget. Whereas this is much more of a number on a pure per pupil basis. That's a very different criteria mm -hmm. than a percentage of the entire school budget. So I think that this 
this thing that's going to have to be carefully looked at, but uh, carefully evaluated, and somehow we better as um, a town, and I have a suggestion in the long run about how we can leverage ourselves something more than five out of 280, which, as we all know, Cape Luke was not exactly well loved in the legislature, uh, well. certainly not by um, the, the former press at all. Um, that that's, that's a different standard than what's in the statute. It's a much tougher standard. And um, I'm just concerned that the DOE is going to uh, adopt some, uh, a, a, either a more limited um, or um, uh, especially on the expenditure level than what we currently have. And maybe we won't qualify. Well, uh, I think that. that Something go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it, the DOE had nothing to do with the last section that had to, um, that talks about rulemaking. That was something that I worked with the revisor's office on to, like I said, um, address the concerns of some of my fellow legislators about whether or not school districts that were exempt in 2007 would be held to a stale standard over time and that we would need a standard that was um, evolving and, and not dependent on that report. Um, and I would just note that um, the, the, the section, and I'm, I'm referring to section XXXX-48, um, it says um, that the Department of Education will adopt major substantive rules provisionally to establish efficiency factor for per, per pupil expenditures for system administration. So I guess I disagree that it's an overall per pupil expenditure because it specifically says for system administration. And the fact that they would adopt, that the DOE adopts them provisionally, I think, in my view, it's implicit that if they adopt them provisionally and then they go to the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs at the legislature, that it'll be the standing committee that will ultimately um, you know, work through the rules and vote them out of committee like any other legislation, then be before the legislator for legislation. Thank you. The um, the the uh, the House and Senate will have to approve it. So I don't. I, I think you know to the extent that you suggest the Department of Education has something out to. I had nothing but. Um, positive interaction with Commissioner Gendron. She was very helpful at trying to help Cape Elizabeth, at recognizing that we are a unique community with unique needs. And um, I think that I'm confident that we can work with the um, department as well as the education committee on, on doing the rules. I mean, that's just my view. I, 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 before we get too um, uh, post holes, that's the expression I've heard from getting too involved in one issue, um, so I thought I'd start using it. I learned it from the Department of Education, but on this particular <laughs> issue, the, uh, I think it's in your interest, should you go down this path, to certainly participate in the rulemaking process. They do have, since they are major substantive rules, they do have to be approved by the legislature. Um, so it's, it's, it's appropriate to watch it, but the horse might well be out of the barn on your status before that occurs because the, the commissioner writes these rules by December 1, but who knows when the legislature will actually act on them. It may be well into the session, if at all, for that matter. Um, you never know what's going to happen at that level. But why don't we move on and, again, try to stay folks a little bit on the skeleton of this law um, so we can grasp basically how it works. Um, so the alternative plan path, um, what happens in the next step after you've, after you've given a notice of intent as to which path you're going to follow? Well, if, you, if you're intending to follow the left path and form an RSU, you have to form a re regionalization planning committee. Now, some of you may have heard that term. Um, talked about or referred to on the various materials uh, that have been put out by a lot of different people, including the Department of Ed on this law. And there's been some advice that you should be doing that now. Um, I, I can see why the Department wants people to get going that, that as quickly as possible, given the time frames, but logically speaking, if you're going down the alternative plan path, or likely to, or seriously considering that, 
you're not going to even have a regionalization plan. You don't have to have one. And you know, you're not really, at that point, you're not really talking to partners, so you're not doing a regionalization plan. Um, but again, it's, it's my suggestion that um, it's a good idea to explore your options before August 31st so that you will have considered whether it's a good idea for you to consider consolidation with another unit. If, if you've done that, I think whatever plan you propose is likely to be more favorably received by the Department of Education. Yes, sir. I appreciate the explanation, and you know, I think everyone assumes we're going to head to the right. Uh, but what is the school department doing to conform with the requirement to review options for consolidation and partnering with nearby units? From, from, the, from the point of view of the school department, what I have been doing is I've worked with um, Suzanne Godin, who is the superintendent of South Portland. You remember that was in the initial plan. So we have talked about that. And as a matter of fact, she met with her school board and uh, city council last night. Uh, and we are meeting tonight. So that is one of the steps that I'm taking because I know I have to do due diligence in order to look at this. At the same time, I've been in contact with several districts, including Yarmouth, including Freeport, uh, to take a look at, even if we don't become an RSU completely, what we could do as far as sharing costs, for instance, in transportation, food services, and some aspects of special education. So those are the two pieces I've done so far. Uh, the other piece that could be done, I have not done at this point, is to talk with Scarborough. Scarborough is now at around th uh, 3,500 students. South Portland is at 31. But uh, South Portland was at least willing to talk with us and get some ideas behind that. So that's where I am at this point. And I did go to uh, the state superintendent's conference uh, last week uh, to talk with some other superintendents or amongst those six who are the high-performing districts and talk about what they're planning to do at the same time. So you know, and I ask these questions to make sure issues get out. Of sure. You know, I'm not questioning anything other than trying to get information out. So what's the school board's plan for meeting over the summer in order to uh, prepare the notice of the tenant? I think from, from my perspective, and I certainly would turn to Kathy, too, this is our first meeting. We really wanted to get some feedback from the town council, uh, from the board members, and from the public. And then we are going to have to arrange some, some way for us to meet, begin to take a look at all the possibilities and how we would move on from there. I think one of the biggest issues for me in this whole process is looking at costs. And what are the combinations of costs? What are the differences between them, et cetera? And so that's what I see as, as next steps in the process. This really tonight is an informational meeting. I don't know, Kathy, if you had any other thoughts on that or not. Well, I just wanted to take go from tonight and then try to set up a meeting. We have a meeting scheduled in August, but it's too late. So I, I want to try to schedule a meeting earlier in August so that the school board can act on whatever they need to act on by that, by that time so that there's plenty of time for Alan to, to finish up um, putting together our notice of intent for August 31st. Thank you both. Just, just to follow down the left path a little bit further, um, even though it may well not be a path that CAPE takes, I think it's good to, to have some understanding of what it is. Um, the re re regionalization Planning Committee forms and comes up with a plan. This is between August 31 and December 1 of 2007. Come up with a plan, act in good faith and with due diligence to complete it by December 1, 2007 and submit it to the commissioner by 2001-2007. If, despite due diligence and good faith, it's not done by December 1, 2007, it can be submitted later, and there's no penalty. The only penalty would be if you didn't act diligently and in good faith. Now, taking the alternative plan path, again, no regionalization planning committee is required, um, but something must be submitted to the commissioner by December 1, 2007. And what is that thing? It is a plan that must address how the school administrative unit, and just to remind people of the terminology here, the Cape Elizabeth School Department is a municipal school administrative unit. It is a school administrative unit. It's not saying it's a school administrative district, but 
unit is a generic term that covers all types of uh, forms of school organization in Maine. So how the school administrative unit will reorganize administrative functions, duties, and non-instructional personnel so that the projected expenditures of the reorganized school unit in fiscal year 0809 for system administration, transportation, special education, and facilities and maintenance will not have an adverse impact on the instructional program. It's kind of interesting the way that reads, because until you get that to will not, it sounds like there's going to be some very concrete direction. And then it ends up by saying, you have to plan those things in a way so they won't have an adverse impact on the instructional program. Yes, sir? Uh, this implies that there are some cost cuts, obviously. So, I mean, this implies that there is a target, budget target, and they're saying, look at this budget target, how can we down not to affect adversely? I think that's a, that's a very good very good point because if I had to think about what the department would be looking for in this plan, we have the system of school funding now called Essential Programs and Services, which I will not and cannot explain to you in detail right now, but um, essential program, the way essential programs or EPS works is that um, the experts decide how much money you need to spend to meet the standards of the learning results in all the different areas of budgeting. So there's an amount for administration, transportation, uh, teacher salaries, so on and so forth. And I suspect that those figures for those categories, namely system administration, transportation, special ed and facilities and maintenance, those EPS targets probably will be the benchmark by which your plan under this process will be considered. And I don't know how you do in those particular areas right now, and I'm not sure that anyone knows right now. Do you want to address but that? I, I think the, the thing that I can tell you is having gone to the superintendent's conference, they have already set a an amount of money around system administration. It's called the 204. So it's $204 per student. Uh, the transportation, special education, facilities, and maintenance, what I understand is they will be coming out with figures for us on that, which then plays back to the EPS formula. So we're still waiting to hear what that is, but they did have that figure of $204 per student in the system. It is do a such challenge a because, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. It is going to be a challenge because all those areas are the EPS amounts, the so-called EPS allocations for each of those categories is going to be cut. It's going to be cut by 50, the state is cutting it by 50% for system administration, which is the biggest one, which ends up with 204 per student under our current numbers. And it's going to be 5% each for transportation, facilities and maintenance and special ed. Special ed is a tough one because that's a cost, as, as Dominic knows, it's very hard to predict or to control and you have federal law mandating that you meet the needs of special ed students. Yes. I think it's ironic because after the seven or eight objectives that you have will be a challenge. And the, the, theory, the theory, I think, that the basic uh, article of faith behind this law was that you can save a lot of money by consolidating administration. And again, I think reasonable people can have different opinions about that. But, um, and they, for whatever reasons, they targeted this area, these areas, I think, transportation facilities, um, you could say those don't relate to the instructional prob uh, program directly, so they, they ought to be good target areas. System administration, you could make the same argument, although there are arguments to the contrary. But special education is substantive delivery of instruction, 
and it has to meet the requirements of the, the state and federal law, so that could be a particular challenge. When this law was first drafted, by the way, or during one of the drafts, not only were the, the state allocations, the EPS allocations for these areas reduced, but they were going to require all local spending to be reduced by the same amounts. That was taken out of the final bill. So you can spend more if you want, but it's not going to be subsidized by the state. Yes? I have a question for Alan. Um, you mentioned the uh, $204 per student um, benchmark for system administration costs. Do you know what we currently are spending? Um, I can't remember if I have that down here or not. Did was Pauline? Pauline, what did we come up with when we worked on this before? I did ask what currently we spend. What the cut will be between the three hundred and four and what state provides currently or uh, I'm not sure what, what I'm asking. asking. What do we spend? She's asking what is it now? What we're Per, yes. How many dollars per student do we now spend on system administration? I don't have a per student um, total, uh, but we do spend about $1,000 per student for the first year. Um, Cynthia, Cynthia just handed me this financial indicators thing for pupil expenditures, which shows for system administration in what year? 0506. 0506, $291. So that's There's nothing to prohibit us from offloading <coughs> expenses out of the school budget into a municipal budget, for example, facilities costs. But we must suggest, just for example, uh, that we can move to a system where we, we provide all the maintenance and just charge the schools uh, an amount that brings them down under that level. Yes. I'm just curious. I, that was a question. I, that was a question. <laughs> Notice that I didn't answer it. <laughs> um, no, I think it's a good question. I, and I'm not sure to what extent that will be permitted. I think it's certainly worth exploring. I would I'd encourage you to do so, but I can't give you a definitive answer on it right now. Yes. My question is just, um, how often will this be reviewed, and how concrete will the um, benchmarks or the standards be? Like, will there be a set of numbers? Because I guess my fear is that this will be like a damn sword that hangs over us every year when we review the budget process. And the irony here in our town is that we're so austere that many people in the town feel that we're too austere. So will we be continually cutting because we feel that the, the state's going to come in and hammer us if we don't? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, can we maintain our our regional control and autonomy in light of this state well, intervention. Well, it certainly reduces in the areas we've talked about your discretion somewhat. And I think you, you may be right. But Cynthia said the, the, the rulemaking provision appears to um, provide the means by which going forward DOE can monitor whether you're meeting the requirements of efficiency under the efficient high performing district uh, requirement. And depending on how stringent those are, and that's hard to predict, um, that, that could be a continuing um, issue that you have to deal with. I, I wouldn't dare predict because I just don't know. No. We're in an area with a great deal of uncertainty, um, in, including uncertainty about whether this exception survives the next round of the legislature. Right. I, 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 don't, I just think that we all have to be aware that um, that the legislative process really isn't done on this law, I don't think. And it'll be changed some, will it be changed a lot next year? I don't know. Um, but I think we'll find out once these plans come in, notice the 10th first, then the plans come in December. Everyone's going to look at those, DOE's going to look at those, and if, if overall they're pleased with the results, maybe the thing settles down. If they're not pleased with the results and everyone's trying to file an alternative plan, who knows where it all goes? I mean, I think there's a lot of uncertainty there. And, and certainly what we heard uh, the other day was that probably if we are one of these adjusted schools, that there would be a uh, audit every year for three years to see where we are and then decisions, redecisions can be made at that point in time. That was the understanding the other day. 
uh, as, as to how this is going to play forth. Because I think the, same, the question you're asking is the same question that a lot of people are asking. Can we maintain this level of high performance along with uh, the type of spending that we're talking about? It, it doesn't, the law doesn't actually say what happens if you at some point fall below us. No, it doesn't so at this a point. point. I think uh, uh, on the end, I have a question first on Mary Ann. Is, is the, will not have an adverse impact on the instructional program, is that your summary or is that actually written into the law? That's, that's, that is the law of remaining. So that could be challenged. Pardon I mean, me? what if you're not spending enough and it has an adverse impact on education? Can that be challenged and questioned and... I would like to know, I mean, I would argue that facilities that aren't kept up have an adverse impact on education. Can that be challenged? Will there be some definition? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I would argue if you don't spend enough on administration, you could probably find empirical evidence that a good leader who isn't going to work for free makes a difference in a school system. I would argue the other way. I would ask for more explanation. Define for me what adverse impact on instructional programming is. What is the 204, that number that, uh, is that based on a study that says if you spend 204, your students are going to do really well? No. It's, it's a number that was, sounded good to cut EPS for a system of education by 50%. So it's based on economics, not education. And politically, you know, people, people like it. Yes. I was always talking Mary Ann. That's, that's okay. I'll always, like I'll always defer to the public. Uh, why don't I say me? And oh. you in particular, David. Um, I, I'm curious about something you just said, because it was a question I had. These mandatory cuts that apply to us, whether or not we go alternatively or not, which is 50% cut in administration, 5% cut there, 5% cut there. The way I read this statute, it's not related to EPS. It says, per people for system administration, the actual system administration expenditure. Actual means what we actually spend. So we cut what we actually spend by 50%. No. We're already the no. That's not what it means. You don't. And I, I'm, without, without coming through it, it does, it does mean the EPS targets are being cut by that much. You can uh, spend more to make up for that or spend more than the EPS target. It, and they, but they know perfectly well that the way that works politically, if you're exceeding what the state says is this is the right amount to spend on this category, that it's going to be politically vulnerable, that will the voters support, and we'll get into the voters' involvement in this in a moment. Um, Will the voters support you spending more than the so-called experts have said is the right amount to deliver the service? And the fact is, is that you are now spending a lot more than EPS overall, and over 80% of the districts in Maine are spending a lot more than, or more or a lot more than EPS. Could you do me a favor at some point? Just I could not find what you just said, but you know, do it now. But yeah. at some point, you might got to show me the magic. I, I didn't find it, and uh, I think you're absolutely correct. The crunch comes, and we have to have a voter referendum. And then you make sure you compare what you're spending versus EPS. EPS was always intended to be the floor of our ceiling, but the administration now says it's the ceiling, not floor. And the ball actually said that 80% of the schools remain off the house one way. We spend 80% more than the minimum. One would hope that we would spend more than the minimum. But that's. Uh, it would make me feel better if I saw 80% lower than EPS, although I'm sure we spend more than EPS uh, anyways, but it, it seems to me that we actually make those cuts. I know it's not supposed to be sort of that way as well. Well, I think there's going to be pressure. I just want to react to Mike's comment about offloading costs from the school to the municipal side, and I think while that may have some attraction, we need to be very careful because it strikes me that you might be able to offload for one year and then the commissioner in their definitions of an efficient school system is going to scrutinize. Well, oh, you don't have any janitorial costs? Oh, they're all on the municipal side? We will impute that <laughs> into your budget. So I think that 
we need to be careful that we're not too clever by a half and then find the legislature um, I, I or agree. the commissioner saying, now I also understand that because of our one town concept, we have a lot of things that are intertwined and I think we can take an honest, hard look at that, but I think we need to also be very careful that we're not just too clever by a half. Um, and I just don't want people to leave the room thinking we can offload stuff on the municipality, but, but we should look carefully at our one town concept. So. Whatever it's worth now, one of the ones that made it, it's being scrutinized and sort of puts it totally being scrutinized for that very same right. concern that they are actually doing that. But there's some areas we can do it without question. Correct. Yeah. That's right. But I think we just need to be careful that we're not being too clever. Well, what, what a, just a brief intro comment on that is to the extent that you do share with the municipal side, you are, you are, you are accomplishing one of the, the goals of consolidation. And if you, if you move into a regional school unit, you may lose some of those efficiencies That's right. while trying to gain them somewhere else. Gentlemen in the back. Is that written as a goal that all school districts should be reducing the fact that their total cost high, or is that a state goal regarding what they want to reduce state funding for those services by proportion? It's closer to the latter. So what the EPS allocation for, say, transportation statewide will be cut 5%. Now, that's, a, that's an aggregate number. If you're already, if you're meeting the, the whatever number that ends up being now, then I don't think anyone's going to expect you to go lower. Now, once that figure is established, again, it doesn't prevent you from raising more than that number. But anything you raise above that number will not be subsidized in any way, which may not be a major issue. In other words, if the state is currently funding, say, 40% of special ed or any of those services, what it really amounts to is a 2% reduction, 5% of that 40% across the state that is in the law, not 5% of 100% of those costs. Um, hmm. It's a 5, no, it's a 5%. The, the EPS allocation is, the EPS budget is, is they can give you a budget for what they think your school system should run on. That's the EPS allocation. That's 100, in theory, 100% of your costs. So when they cut EPS allocation by 5%, they are cutting it 5% of 100%. And it's, it's not an actual funding thing. It's the allocation. Um, and it's, it, 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 is, it establishes the amount that will be available for subsidy. So if you have a million dollars on transportation as your EPS allocation, and you spend another $500,000 on it, the million will be subsidized at whatever your rate is, but that additional 500000 will not be subsidized at all. And you're also going to have to tell your voters that it's over your EPS. Um, and we, you know, it, well, I'll, I'll stay away from editorializing. It's hard for me to do. <laughs> the uh, I'd just like to, to move along a little bit. The, the last point on the on the right-hand path, the alternative plan path, is uh, the law is not clear on whether the commissioner has to approve an alternative plan. And I think this was sort of a, an oversight of the statute because it's very clear that if you submit uh, uh, a, a regionalization plan to form an RSU that there are all these criteria that apply and the commissioner has to approve or disapprove it by December 15th but it's not there's nothing explicit about what the commissioner does with alternative plans I think it's reasonable to assume that they're certainly going to look at that uh, that reorganization to that doesn't have an adverse effect on the instructional program thing. Will, will the commissioner look further? Well, the commissioner will probably look at certainly whether you do in fact meet the high performing 
uh, and, high, and efficient school district standard. And if you meet all those criteria, does the commissioner automatically approve you? I leave you with the question. <laughs> you know, we, this is really, a, it's a work in, in progress. Yes, sir. Is there an expectation that actually this decision by the commissioner will be done on an annual basis? So one year you're in, one year you're out? I mean, is there a kind of writing station that will provide some kind of longer term commitment? You mean on the, particularly on the uh, high performing? Oh, or any of the exceptions, yeah. yeah. Because basically, if you're high performing, I mean, and same with budget, you know, high performing is sufficient. I mean, you know, year to year, you know, I can imagine the system will be consolidated and unconsolidated, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the things about the high performing efficient district is, is once you join an RSU, so you did join the RSU. I don't know how you ever get out under that exception because there will be no means necessarily to measure it. Um, but did you have something on the train? No, I was just curious to see how you're going to answer that because it's been a question we've all had. I think, I think, as 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 Cynthia said, I think there's there's going to be ongoing review of whether you meet the high performing and efficient standards because. They're certainly not going to let you do it one year, then all of a sudden go way off track and let you stay there. Well, my, my view is, um, with respect to your question, is that um, although the commissioner has an incredible amount of discretion in this whole consolidation initiative, in this one area, I don't see it as discretionary. I mean, it's a statutory definition and it's a law that says you can file an alternative plan if you meet this statutory defined definition and if you apply the law to the facts and you do, it seems to me it's not discretionary. Wait, what's the flip side? I just didn't follow you. Basically you're saying three schools have to be high performance schools. Yes. Automatically, therefore, what classifies is high performing this. If one of the schools fails in one year. Well, that's, the, well, yeah. This report, this Silver Nair report, see, this, is, this was just, just very briefly. Um, when I was trying to suggest to people that this consolidation effort wasn't good for everyone because there are some districts that are already efficient, um, and, and are doing a good job, the response was, yeah, but everybody thinks they're high performing and efficient. So then this report comes out that identifies with criteria, supposedly objective, taking into account socioeconomic, so, and, and it lists the schools I, by name. So for just this budget, I mean, you've got to remember, this was a budget that had to be passed by two-thirds of the legislature or the state would shut down. So there was some urgency to getting it through. So for this year, the identification of high performing is relying on this report. But going forward, there's going to be these substantive the major and substantive measure. rules. That's so going to take this report out of it. And so, yes, you're. I'm just hoping that it will be looking at multi-year and pictures. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, I know, don't think it's going to be flip flopping, flip flopping back and forth. But Cynthia, my guess is that the commissioner is going to make an attempt in the rulemaking to address that very issue yeah. of how you continue to be a high performing school and what happens if you don't meet the criteria that it seems to me that would be an obvious part of mm -hmm. the rulemaking. And it has to be because the, the statute itself doesn't answer the questions that you've asked. Um, to just to, I want to make sure we we cover what I know you're going to have to do um, as well as some of the speculation about what might or might not happen. And this is the, the second page of the flow chart. Just on the left, real quickly, again, if you're on the reorganization track, you're supposed to try to have a re referendum, local referendum, by January 15th. Uh, if the plan is approved at referendum, you're supposed to try to implement by July 1, 2008, but possibly July 1, 2009. And then you have to go ahead and create this whole new district, hire a superintendent, transfer the school property into the new unit, um, transfer the assets, transfer the school debt, with, with regard to school debt, any state-funded school debt has to be assumed by the new regional unit. 
any strictly locally funded debt without state support, the new school unit doesn't have to accept, which is a very interesting facet of this law, um, because um, on the one hand, the, the re new regional school board can say, we want that school that you built with local debt only, but they could say, we're not going to take the debt. Now, will that really happen? It seems so unreasonable and unfair. Probably not, but the law seems to allow for at least for negotiation over those issues. Um, transfer all employees to the new regional school unit. Um, and uh, to go over to the alternative plan track, again, if you go the alternative plan, you don't need any local vote of approval. You're basically going to continue as you are with some new requirements that you'll have to meet. There will still be municipal school units. There will be two forms of school administration in the state of Maine. One will be the new regional school units, or RSUs, and the other will be municipal school units. SADs will be gone. CSDs will be gone. School unions will be gone. But municipal school units will still be around. Now, going to the paths merge again on this one issue of budget validation and budget approval process. And this is important because this is something you're going to have to deal with this coming budget year. Um, all school units in the state of Maine are going to have to use the new this budget format and budget approval process. So I think it's worth spending a moment on what that is. First of all, there's a format requirement used to be you could basically set up a budget the way you wanted within certain limitations, but it's now mandatory that you have lines separately voted on by the parties who will be voting, which we'll talk about in a minute, for each of these categories. Regular instruction, special ed, career and tech, and we'll go through all of them, but one thing I would point out, which again is a deliberate attempt to really zero in on central administration, there's a distinction between system administration and school administration. So whereas you might have put, you might or might not have put your principals and your superintendent and your special ed director all together in your budget in the past, it's clear that you're going to have to make a distinction between system-wide administration on the one hand and building level administration on the other hand, and then the other categories. So each of these has to be voted on. Now, by whom and how? Well, we have this budget validation process. This is, uh, this budget validation concept was made part of this, an optional part of the school law. Oh, it must be seven or eight years ago now. And Four districts adopted it, and one dropped it, so it was down to three. I think my numbers are right on that. So it didn't prove to be a popular choice for a budget process. Um, but the department feels very strongly that this is a budget process that everybody should use. So they insisted on this being in the law and applying to everyone, whether you consolidate or not, whether you're a municipal school unit or whether you're a regional school unit. So how does it work? Well, the school board prepares a budget as usual. The school board then submits that budget to the legislative body. That's the language in the statute. Legislative body at, uh, in Cape Elizabeth, I believe, is your town council. If you were a town meeting form of government, it would be the town meeting. But in council forms of government, like Cape, a lot of towns around here, Portland, South Portland, whatever, the legislative body, the ultimate authority, is the council. So it's submitted to the council. Then the council will act on the budget. Each of those 11 lines plus total expenditures that I just showed to you. And they, the council approves the budget. Pretty much the way you are now, but it doesn't stop there. Within 10 days after the council approves the budget, 
there has to be what's a, a, a referendum, what they call a budget validation referendum, um, where all the voters have the opportunity to vote yes or no, up or down, on the budget that's been approved by the council. Um, ten days, short period of time. Um, so that's how much time you'll have to educate the public about what was approved and to the extent you want to, try to build support among the voters for approval of that budget. Uh, that's a maximum of ten days. And people will come in and they'll vote. The question will be something like, do you approve the budget, yes or no? Um, that's short and, and you vote it up or down. If if it's approved, you're all done. If it's not approved, you start the process over again, right at the top. And you keep doing it over again until you get a budget. Uh, ideally, you do it, get it the first time, but theoretically, it could go on ad infinitum. Yes? So the concept is to approve every line of this, and the lines of the budget separately. And you can also reject any of the slides and send it back to the council. I believe, although it's not written maybe explicitly, I think the council looks at each of those lines. So you can reject. Well, they're going to come up with something. They're going to come. They're going to. They may not accept the school board recommendation for a certain line. They'll just change it. Don't worry. And they'll approve a number. And then. That whole thing in the aggregate is voted yes or no. The voters don't vote on every single one. Now, Bruce, that's radically different yes. from today, yes. where we vote on the bottom line yes. budget. And that's expressly in the statute. No. No. OK, <laughs> yes. that's what I'm getting at then. Since it's so radically different, yes. it strikes me that there's at least a plausible argument mm -hmm. that without express language in the statute that we vote on line items, that yeah. in fact we vote on the single budget, yeah, and I, the I, bottom line it's number. It's an interesting question because it's, I thought some about it today. It doesn't ex say explicitly, but let's say you were a town meeting form of government. It is clear to me that the town meeting would get those 11 separate articles and they'd vote on each one. And they're the legislative body, and then, it, then, I, then I come around to, well, the town council's the legislative body. Why can't they act the same way? But it, it doesn't come out and explicitly say that. I don't know whether thought was given to how significant that change was and whether they really knew what they were doing. It doesn't even make sense in a town meeting format where you theoretically have all voters are entitled to go and vote, but yet you're going to turn around and have... An election ten days later. Uh, That's academic in terms of yeah. Cape Elizabeth. But. Bruce, but even, even though our charter says the council only acts by voting for the single department budget, currently the State Department of Education gives us three pages of, of draft motions that you need to insert the numbers in. So they've always been violating our charters anyway and what the requirements are. Well, that, the chair, I'm glad you made that point because I think you also want to look at your charter and, and you have to look at it in comparison to this new law and reconcile the two. Where they can be reconciled, I think the charter will still stand. Where the law clearly conflicts with the charter, I think the basic principle is that the statute trumps the yeah. charter. Um, but where there's any gap in the law, Home Rule tells us that the charter prevails. And so we'd have to, you'd have to sit down with, those, with the law and the charter to run that through. Um, and, you know, there's also policy issues about how you would want to approach it, whether it's better to say, school board, we don't like this whole thing, and here's why we don't like it, go back and do the whole thing over again, which is what you're probably accustomed to, the approach you're accustomed to taking, and you could continue to do that uh, regardless. Yes? How explicit is the language on the yes, no? And the reason I ask that is, would, would we be prohibited from, say, yes, no, on the budget? And then another, a second question on a referendum, yes, no, on a supplement to the budget, which potentially would have been something that we this town might have considered over the past couple of years with some of the debate. 
Yeah, that, that's uh, another good question that I can't give you a definitive answer to. Well, I warned you about that when I started. I, 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 only the council can vote a warrant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if there's additional questions, you know, that the council would choose to have as an advisory manner for whatever reason, only the council can so vote. And, and it may well be that, let's say the board, school board asks the council to put on additional articles. So that's sort of the question, and that the council might be perfectly happy to do that if it's lawful to do so. This is what the law actually says uh, the warrant must say uh, in a specific situation. Uh, but um, if your budget exceeds EPS, which it it, it will. It, will. Um, <laughs> it has to be phrased this way. This is the article that goes to the voters. Do you favor approving the Cape Elizabeth budget for the school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted at the, see this has to be modified though because it doesn't really fit you, at the latest regional school unit budget meeting. No, it wasn't adopted at that. It was adopted by the town council. And that includes locally raised funds that exceed the required local contribution as described in the Essential Programs and Services Funding Act. There, what the, the whole purpose of writing this is to, is to make sure the voters know that you're exceeding EPS. Um, and then, yes or no. Um, and all that language is straight out of the statute. So going back to your question, could you, could you, uh, um, separate the questions in the old, in the vote to the at referendum this implies that you have to do it this way and this way only uh, but I'm not don't pin me down on that by any means because you know we're still studying this and figuring figuring out the ins and outs of this law so, so Bruce what you're saying right now is the question wouldn't even have in it the amount of the budget no it would simply have this question so all the 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 ballots and everything could be prepared and be yes. made available the, the morning after the council vote. This is specific. Or before the council vote. Because yeah. it doesn't have a number. What it, the law requires is that in the period, in that 10 day period, the school board has to generate information about what the council approved, including posting that information at the, at the place, at the ballot place. It doesn't have to be in the ballot itself, but it's got to be prominently posted so when you walk in, you can see what was approved. There's also a provision about absentee ballots that um, there's going to be a problem with absentee ballots in this because of Ten days. deadlines. And uh, the law says, and I don't know how, whether this is going to work at all, but the law says that if an absentee ballot comes in before the council approves the budget, then it has to be rejected. That makes sense because you're voting on something that doesn't even exist. But um, there are also other requirements about get timelines about getting on absentee ballots. I don't know if they're going to work at all. Yeah. Is there a relationship between the town vote and the, the commissioner's willingness to continue the exemption? So what if year after year our town, our town in a large majority gives a thumbs up and says, yes, we want to go above it, and then she comes in and looks at it and says, well, you're not quite as austere as the state numbers. But we say, but the entire town is happy. Is that, is there any connection between? You have to vote for three years, and then I think yeah. there's some provision yep. that says that after three years, you can have a vote to suspend the vote? Yes, well, that, yeah. th that's a good point. You can drop this process after three years if the vote is approved, right? but as to your question, um, I don't know. I, strictly speaking, the law doesn't state that that's, as Cynthia will tell you, it doesn't state that that's a criterion in deciding whether high-performing um, efficiency should be approved. Um, but again, I, I might go back to at least those specific areas they've identified as system administration, special ed, transportation, maintenance, as areas where they probably will be looking uh, at um, uh, how you compare to EPS, particularly system administration, of course, because that's the one that's specifically mentioned in the exception for high-performing efficient districts. Um, there are also a lot of complex issues that, that we haven't had a chance to study 
about what exactly goes in the system administration and what can go on other lines in the budget. How much flexibility is there? Um, I'm certain, you know, it's tight enough where, you know, it's not going to be possible to sort of uh, um, avoid the requirements, but there may be some reasonable opportunity for planning with regard to how you create your budget that, that uh, leaves you some flexibility there. The real danger is there's other laws that don't allow anything at the polling place that's intended to persuade voters. Mm. But it has to be totally factual. Yes, it'll have to be totally objective. It can't be, um, can't be uh, campaign literature. Um, so that, you know you're going to be dealing with that. You're going to be dealing with that this spring, this coming spring. So uh, that's one sure thing to know about. And again, within three years, you be able to propose to drop it if you wish to do so. Um, now, turning back to the left track again, um, what if regional plan gets uh, does not get approved by the voters by November fourth, nineteen or two thousand eight? Well, the result are the result is penalties. And these penalties are general. Um, that one didn't look right. Oops. Just missed it. Basically, it's penalty for non-compliance with the law. Um, the it's not something I necessarily recommend, but. When I hear about some, what school boards are doing in terms of planning on this issue, one of the options they're, they're looking at is accepting the penalties rather than um, to consolidate. Uh, and anyone considering that would have to one these, uh, these penalties carefully and calculate what the cost would be. I have no idea how these would play out, say, for K, if you did decide to go that route for some reason that the, the other exception didn't work out now or in the future. Um, but the penalties are that the school administrative unit is eligible for only 50% of the minimum state allocation. That applies to high receivers. Are you on a minimum? Yeah. No, we're not. No. Okay. Um, the school administrative unit's total cost of education is reduced by adjusting the cost component for system administration by half. Again, that's another EPS um, thing, that they would yet again take your system administration and cut that figure for, uh, by half again, again, for EPS purposes only. The school administrative unit would not be eligible for transition adjustment. Do you get that? You, you probably don't, but no. the school administrative unit receives less favorable consideration for approval and funding of school construction. That's one that might be a little more frightening to, to some people but not if, to they, us. if they yeah. anticipate. We, get we don't get any, though. Well, I mean, that some people bother. and other yeah. places <laughs> around the state. Um, and, and yet another that was added at the last minute is that you. some of you may be aware of uh, because of LD1, we're supposedly ramping up to 55% state funding of education, which is really 55% state funding of EPS. It's not 55% it's not state funding of education. So if you want, the state wants to, to reduce its costs of subsidizing education despite its commitment to increase its percentage, it simply can reduce EPS, thereby um, having an impact on the total, what that 55% comes out to. But in any event, one of the penalties is, uh, another of the penalties is that if you do not comply with the law, you will not be a beneficiary of reducing your, the local share to 45%. It would be 
46.14%. Again, I have no idea what the, what the uh, financial significance of that would be. I think that, that should you go the high performing efficient uh, unit, this will not be an issue for you if you successfully go that, that direction. Um, but this will be an issue for those RSUs that are proposed and voted down because there will be some. The, the impulse for local control is extremely powerful everywhere in this state. So it would not surprise me if there's some voter resistance to some of these consolidation plans that is expressed at the polls. But again, there may be some who, who decide from square one that they're not going to even pursue it. They say, well, we'll take our medicine and go forward in order to achieve, to, to maintain our independence. <clears throat> yes? Well, I've heard of, I've heard things mentioned. We haven't studied the issue. No one has has asked us to specifically analyze that possibility. Um, I think that overall, it would be a long shot. I mean, without having studied the issue, my impression is that there's nothing overtly unconstitutional about this law. There, there was something in the previous version that was actually removed. Um, but there's, we don't think there's anything overtly unconstitutional. So there, leaving the debt to, to seize your assets, essentially, and leaving the debt to Well, I don't know. I, I don't think it, if I can respond, yeah, it doesn't right. strike me as being unconstitutional because the municipalities are just agents of the state. We are arms of the state. So the state is taking from one arm of the state and giving to another arm of the state. Um, I, I just don't see any basis um, for a constitutional challenge. Um, I can respectfully agree with you. That's one of the provisions that some people do think is unconstitutional. Taking the property, even though we have all arms of the state, our tax dollars, not self government tax dollars, like the building. That, okay, and that would be a case that a private individual, private property holder would bring. I was reacting from the standpoint of a municipality. I don't think a municipality has a claim. I've not looked at it from the standpoint of a private taxpayer. And, but I still think it strikes me it's a long shot. Yeah. I think the limit, not that I'm focused on this, but I think that some of the legal challenges that may be forthcoming are going to be in the form of, let's say the commissioner disapproves of a plan, and then those who are disappointed by her decision are going to look at very carefully at whether the discretion was exercised consistent with the law and, and basic legal principles. And uh, that's another thing that's that's not really dealt with in the statute is what if you what if you don't like what the commissioner did, what's your recourse? Mm -hmm. And there probably is a right to um, seek judicial review to file a complaint in the district court and and challenge the commissioner's decision. Now you have to have a basis to show that the commissioner's decision was, was violated the law in some way or violated the state constitution. It's unlikely the federal constitution would come into play. Uh, but we, you know, there may well be litigation down the road in that arena. Yes? If hey, Caitlin Clinton were to join a regional support unit, I don't understand how this budget validation would work because you have more than one legislative body and what if one community votes yes and another votes no? In, in a regional school unit? Right. Good question. Um, the regional school unit, your, your legislative body would become your voters. The whole thing. So, um, 
Uh, if, just say, you were to combine with South Portland and Scarborough, the new legislative body for that unit would be all of the voters. So you'd have a, a meeting of all the voters from all of your towns to, as the first round of the budget process. That's like a, a meeting. big town meeting. Then you have, yeah, big town meeting, and then you have a referendum. But it's not, once you go into a regional school unit, it's like a school administrative district for those who are familiar with that. The municipality loses all standing. The municipality basically becomes irrelevant as, as, a, as a participant in any way in the governance uh, or budget, budget making or budget deciding. Uh, and that's the way it's been with, with SADs all along. And that's the way it's going to be with RSUs. So that might be an advantage to join an RSU is that school budgets would no longer be subject to municipal council review. And, and I'm not going to step into that one, but... Why would that be the case when you think about partners and They spend a lot more than us. The regional school unit... They make sense. Yeah, they may not be spending it wisely, but... The government would like us to think of every possibility. Yes. I think it's for that reason that Alan and I and Floyd were talking to the government, because I think you have to consider whether we're combining services, even if it's not consolidation, or if it's a partnership we're developing that could be something more in the future, you want to pick a town that's similarly sized or smaller and that has similar views on education, of educational approaches, government, et cetera, to align ourselves with a much larger town simply because its neighbor may not be in our interest, whether it's for some of these short-term issues or the longer term. Well, what if, are there any ways in which it would, would be in your interest? Is there any what? Any ways in which it would be in your interest? Oh. Okay. Well, I was just going to point out that the, um, the law specifically says that even if you decide not to consolidate and become a regional school unit, nothing prevents you from having, um, you know, collaborations. And so you could, we could collaborate with other districts like Yarmouth and do some things to enhance special ed. And it won't prevent us from doing collaborative things with other um, districts to save money and to enhance our educational program. Um, so my feeling is that we would stay away from the regional school units altogether because of all the, the problems it would. But, but I would suggest that even collaborating with someone two or three times your size is dangerous in terms of their influence over the things that they're all going to be collaborating. Okay. Unless you're buying oil. To be fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just a numbers game. The, the policy, there, there, there are, I think you can come up with educational reasons. Now let's say that the South Portland can afford to have a, a Chinese language curriculum because they're big. And you want your students to be able to take Chinese. Well, I mean, there are different ways you can accomplish it. RSU isn't the only way. But, um, you know, there could be opportunities for more expanded program courses that you wouldn't otherwise be able to have. Um, you know, facilities, opportunities that you wouldn't have. Uh, and I think. You know, in fairness to the departments and the commissioner's point of view, these are some of the things that they would be saying if they were here. Um, or if you went to one of their regional meetings that they had. How many have gone to one of those? A few people. But those, those would be all done as of July 15th. Yes, sir. Um, I want to ask Alan, earlier you mentioned the park a couple of times, and I wrote two down, and I don't know if you said it was in Scarborough. In Yarmouth and Freeport, I haven't talked. I haven't had in-depth conversations with Scarborough. I have had in-depth conversations with South Portland, uh, with Yarmouth, and with Freeport. If I may be in public, <laughs> I guess still have some rights. Um, if I, as a public person, not a public person, as a citizen, um, I would suggest that we would proceed on two alternative approaches. As well as possible, and I would personally prefer the Army Street Court of Fountain for multiple reasons. One is a similarity in philosophy, similarity in spending. Quite frankly, they are just, therefore, yeah, when it comes time to build schools, we still keep our high school in Cape Elizabeth. 
doesn't make sense. You can't build a school in between high school and high school, more likely enough with two high schools, which quite frankly, we keep out of the key semi autonomous local control because we have our own high school, our middle school, and our own elementary school. Whereas if it's, say, for example, so Poland or Scarborough, the tendency might be to build a school that's possible uh, in between the two of us. And, and my understanding of the, of the way this law is written right now, if you have two towns that both have high schools, you would maintain your two high schools. What I don't understand, what I haven't had a clear indi indication of is, if you have one high school that is not performing at the same level as the other high school, uh, NCLB would tell you if you have more than one of a certain type of building in your district, then the students could opt to go to the other school. I don't know if that will fit under NCLB with this plan or not, but you know, as an example, if, if a town we go with has a lower performing school, is it possible for them to transfer their kids to, into CAPE schools because they're performing higher? That is an answer I haven't been able to get yet. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't think that we could keep both schools because it's the majority vote of the RD board as to whether or not you can keep a school done and slowly they I mean, I think it's a closing clause, but it's essentially worthless. And especially it's worthless after three years, because they both three years closed. It's closed regardless. So the two thirds of the right yeah. school unit board to, that is needed right. to initiate a closing. So that's why I'm, I'm advocating for it's worth it. Yeah, it's along the lines of somebody relatively equal size and equal interests. Bruce, can you give us um, uh, your opinion of what our next steps are? Well, you're in that you're in that uh, first phase on this flow chart, and that's you're, you're doing this process tonight. I think you need to continue to do it. I think it's a it's a good idea for uh, you to continue to have discussions with other potential partners um, and uh, um, make a record that you're doing it and do it with, you know, with open eyes and open minds about maybe, maybe there would be something to gain by, by a consolidation with one or more units that are somewhere in this area, whether they're north of Portland or not. And uh, so I think you need to do that, and you don't have a lot of time to do that. You can do that over the next month or so. And um, I think that either the administration or a subcommittee of the board with the administration or some other process come to the board with a recommendation. Um, I think I would recommend that the board have a, a public meeting to invite input on this uh, once again, I realize you've done that tonight. This is more informational. Maybe you could use it like a more of a hearing format to say this is the proposal. We want to hear some input before we um, decide on our notice of intent. But then once you've done that, I think you're ready to, to approve an approach, approve a notice of intent. I don't know if that's too vague, but yeah. you know, we're, all, we're all making this up as we go along. I just have a question. I, I realize there are only about five, six, maybe seven citizens here who are not school employees or town employees, but I'd be interested in getting feedback from those folks tonight based on what you've heard. Um, and I think I know where most people are on this issue, but if people are comfortable say consolidate or go it alone, I'd be interested in. <laughs> I don't have to do that. My view is we gotta do a two prong approach. One, we ought to pursue the exemption that um, Cynthia Dill uh, actually got for us, but I am a bit more pessimist than Cynthia and I think that, that may very well be one of the exemption. Uh, uh, either because they change the cost you know, the, the, the cost from the house and, you know, the position or because of the legislature. You know, it's called a law amendment. It's, uh, I, you know, heck of it. Why don't you find school for the other rest of the town? I think we have to pursue that, and I think we also have to pursue uh, uh, collaboration with enough other schools to like to get that type of exemption. 
to um, uh, possibly broaden in the negotiation of the final education or by amendment to the, uh, the existing bills. Is about how to eliminate that or make it tougher if it's 25 districts out of 280 or 30 districts out of 280 rather than five, especially most of them. Yamath and Cumberland and Yamath and Big and so forth. So I, I think that's our best shot. I think but we have to be very careful to preserve that because I don't see that as a popular exemption, which is somewhat uh, also one of them because the purpose of this bill is to promote efficiency and not performing. You think that they want to have that exemption be satisfied by more schools rather than less, but that's not the way it's looked upon. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think you ought to. Uh, approach towns that you think are compatible and at least start a collaboration process with them with the idea if we ever lose the exemption or we decide, uh, gee, you know, this really looks good, you know, like three boards, whatever, uh, um, maybe we do want to do it as long as we preserve a certain local control in the project. Yes, Jim. Can I ask just a quick following up on what David said, a uh, question for, for uh, Alan? Uh, in your conversations with uh, Freeport and Yarmouth in particular, Alan, do you have a sense of where they are in discussions already with other districts? Yes. What, I, what I'm understanding at this point in time is, for instance, Falmouth is looking at uh, going with Greeley. Mm -hmm. uh, y uh, Yarmouth is considering the same thing we are, standing alone, but has also had conversations with Freeport and uh, I forget the other town. Uh, so there are some discussions going on amongst them about that at this point in time. I know uh, in my latest conversations with Ken, he's really looking strongly at Yama standing alone, just as he thinks we would do the same. May I add my business first to speak to the owner of that school board? David Austin's in a backstop position with uh, free court and people who live as well. This is what I propose to be So at least several of those school board and when you say that you're talking about then Yarmouth? Yarmouth in particular is one I've spoken most to. Okay. Several members of that school board, especially since they think that the kind of I don't want to prejudice that, but they they are concerned about their ability to have long lasting exemption. Uh or maybe the investors change the exemption. They would they would like to have a discussion with the capitalists, but in particular that's what I was talking for. I'm not talking for students, but because I'm not capable, but they would they see it the same way I do with that. That's a life school, allows them to perform the old schools to perform that part, but similar interests and similar uh, pass based, similar school systems and so forth. And they would like a backstop position. At least two out of the maybe more school members. Mm -hmm. School board members. School board members. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else who we haven't heard from that might want to say? Yes. I'm Cynthia Garfield. Um, I was part of a coalition of over 50 parents, including Janet Zimmerman who wrote to Cynthia Dell supporting her um, legislation on the exemption for Kate Elizabeth. So I think the number of emails that Cynthia received is a good proxy for the support within the town. It was the same group of, of parents who come to the um, school budget and they said we want to speak on behalf of the school budget. Um, so it, it was a large number. We you can talk to those numbers. You know, I should have kept track. It was a lot. Every day I'd have like 157 emails, um, but I didn't keep track of the actual number. But it was a lot. It was more than the e more the, I more wow. emails than I got during this um, town budget process. And thank you for your help with that. And thank you. yeah, thank. You. I just have a question for you. Is there some fear in Augusta that this is going to become sort of the Iraq war issue of Maine, that all voters are now going to look at every candidate through this lens and throw them out? I mean, it, it's... Well, Cynthia would probably be the better one to answer that question. But she's our local hero. But I mean, no, honestly, I know, but she, uh, I, if there's so much discontent across the state, are you a little bit fearful that they're going to change the She hangs out with those other people, though. And I, 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 think, um, I, I think you're... Um, if you're assuming that there's a huge amount of discontent, I don't think that's accurate. I think that there's a lot of people, maybe not around here, who recognize in the northern part of the state where there's some school districts who have 400 kids and a superintendent and an assistant superintendent that the consolidation is a good thing if it doesn't detract from the educational programming 
but reduces the overall cost and will hopefully have a positive impact on property taxes. So I don't think it's going to be. Just anecdotally, I, there was an article in the Press Herald on this issue in the last day or two, and they invite reader comments. And so the article's on school consolidation, and there were, oh, it was the article on, uh, of, 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 I won't get into that, but there were nine comments, and they were all in favor of school consolidation. But in Cape, clearly, so, we weren't. But it, it's also, you have to, I don't think we know yet, and yeah. also answer your question, because it's still, even yeah. to this day, it's still sort of abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you go around and you ask some rural manor up north, well, do you think we should cut school administration? You know the answer. But, that, but then they cut, you come along with a plan that says your local school is going to become part of a unit and it's going to be subject to the control of a regional school board. You, I think we're going to see some, some uh, reaction to that. And it's, it's one of those things where once it becomes real rather than abstract, I think it's, it's, the jury's out on it politically. Mm -hmm. that way. Gentleman in the blue shirt. That's okay. You were asking for feedback from the public here in case it's not obvious on theme and opposed to consolidation. And I think, sort of, to follow up to that question, I don't think people realize yet statewide the impact of this. And I think there is going to be quite a bit of reaction from people and understand this is probably the most profound piece of legislation that's been passed in 50 years in terms of its impact on people's lives and communities. I think we define our, school, our communities by our schools. We choose the communities to live in, where we buy our homes, how much we pay for them, primarily based on schools. And this, sort of under the guise of saving a little bit of administrative cost, is actually a complete takeover of local education and municipal decision making by engineered uh, by Augusta. And I think once people understand that a little better and start to participate in these kinds of processes around the state, there's going to be quite a different reaction. But I just want to mention one other comment. I think, first of all, it's kind of unconscionable that the one population that is singled out in the legislation to be essentially attacked are special <coughs> education students. And, that, and actually, I find the language that was mentioned earlier by Bruce saying that special education is somehow not part of the instructional program to be highly offensive. And as the parent of a, a student who receives special education services, what I would urge the school board to do, because I think you're probably already in discussions and will be having discussions about how you can align things potentially in the special education category, is to involve some parents in that discussion. Because these are the students who are the most vulnerable, can't speak for themselves, I know Dominic has an advisory committee that he's worked with occasionally, and I would urge you to involve in some way that group or some similar group of parents in those discussions. Um, I kind of I miss Pepper's uh, mention. And uh, I think what's happening here is uh, it's one of the more, more important decisions, you know, last year, many years of so, you know, the functioning of the school board. And what I would like to see is to really, I mean, the summation of one meeting and then one public here, I would like really to see some an effort to really inform and involve many people, not just the people who are you know, very close to it, but everyone in the whole population of the game. I think it's a great for an exemption, and when I served in years of consultation, it would not be our interest whatsoever. At the same time, I would urge you. I think it's important that we'll look into what we can come and do through this kind of discussions. And I heard very kind of tentative plans of talking about different means, policies, and so on. But I would love to see some kind of real alternatives and you know some real um, um, I guess options that are more for exploring. Maybe there is something positive from this kind of activity. I'm not suggesting that consolidation is about how we seek at all. But there are some aspects of consolidation that we can really pursue beyond this conversation. I like to say, these are, the, these are the things we want to do. And I think it might improve our system. So really, I see it as a, an effort to really get, hopefully, when we get to a public hearing, 
Thank you. Anyone we haven't heard from? We are running over 20 minutes, so. I think originally I began those discussions with South Portland because if you'll remember several weeks ago there was a map that came out suggesting that we take a look at that. And so I had originally been in contact with them, first of all, to look at possibility of combining services like transportation, food service, and those things. And then we began to look further at the need to do very careful consideration of possibilities. Since South Portland is our closest neighbor, uh, we began to have that conversation. And also, of all of the towns that are near us in this general area, uh, South Portland is the smallest, even though it has 3,100 students. And so that's why we began those discussions and at the same time began to take a look at other possibilities with other districts. But that's, that's really where that all started. I, w I remember very clearly when that map came out in the, in the newspaper. Uh, my phone rang off the hook, as did my uh, email, with people having very, very strong feelings. Uh, many of them negative, but some positive. But my feeling is, after listening to what the commissioner said, that we have to use due process in the, in the consideration, that was one of the ways that we felt we needed to do it, because we are such close phys physical neighbors to each other to do that. As far as, as the educational programs, et cetera, uh, certainly uh, we, the compatibility is probably, it's a school system, it operates as a school system, et cetera. I think the performance of our students here in Cape Elizabeth is much higher in, in what we do. I think as far as the one town concept we have here in Cape Elizabeth is not true in South Portland. And it's probably been one of the major issues that the superintendent there and I have discussed over and over again. So compatibility is perhaps, uh, I think I heard somebody say it, there's the possibility with having more students, you could offer programs that we can't now. But there certainly are negative as well as positive plans to this. So I am, I'm not someone who is sitting here saying, I think we need to go with Cape Elizabeth, uh, with South Portland, or any other town as far as that goes. But it was a logical place to, to try to see what are the possibilities out there. I think, I think we would find that there is some consistency, but I think there is some very different uh, thoughts as far as how you operate schools. I think one of the major uh, things that I would see is a very different philosophy about how you run high schools and how you run programs between Cape Elizabeth and South Portland. So there are certainly some things that work well in each community, but there are certainly those things that don't. And uh, I think our, and a good example is our high school and why our high school performs so much better than other schools in the area and how we've been able to keep our AYP status in place. So. I'd like to thank Bruce 
for his time tonight and uh, educating all of us. And thank you to the town council and the school board members, town manager and superintendent for coming out and all the citizens. Um, we will continue the process and um, we have a short time frame, so uh, we will try to make sure that everybody is kept in the loop and knows what's going on and, and try to get as much public involvement as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Good night. Oh, sure. Is there a second? Yes. Thank you.